Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. So here we are. We got another old-timey crimey one for I love you. the old-timey crimeys. They're my favorite crimeys. And also, uh, I don't want to call her a black widow, because that's not quite right, but we do have another uh, killer lady for you. See, like, you say killer lady, I say crazy bitch. <laughs> This is gonna be... <gasps> yeah. This is cool. This is a crazy... I say cool. That sounds terrible. But this is one of those stories that, like... It's a bit of a roller coaster. It kind of has your ups and downs, and it takes you places that you're not really expecting, <laughs> I feel like. You think it's over, and then it gets worse, and then you think it's over again, and then it just gets crazy. But yeah. But today's topic, seriously, you guys, oh boy. For today's case, we're heading way back to the 1930s to tell the story of Winnie Ruth Judd. This is one of those cases where truth becomes stranger than fiction, like we just mentioned. I think both of us, while reading and researching for this case, found ourselves shocked at where the story was going, like, quite a few times. Yes. And honestly, like, it is fun for us to discuss well-known cases, but we really want to try to cover the ones that at least a big chunk of our listeners are going to be unfamiliar with. And honestly, when we started working on the Winnie Ruth Judd story, we knew that we had one that we really, really needed to share with you guys. She's earned her spot in history as the trunk murderess, the blonde butcher, and my favorite, the tiger woman. So let's jump in and talk about the story of Winnie Ruth Judd. Winnie Ruth McKinnell was born in Oxford, Indiana on July 29th, 1905 to Reverend H.J. McKinnell and his wife, Carrie. Not a lot is known about the very early years of her life, but we do know that her upbringing was quite religious because of her father, who was very strict. We do know that even at a young age, she displayed some really concerning behavior towards people who had wronged her. It's said that at the age of 16, her boyfriend broke up with her for another girl, and she went as far as to stage her own abduction. The boy was arrested for the kidnap and sexual assault. Winnie Ruth clearly doesn't handle rejection well. No, and by the age of 17, Ruth, as she preferred to be called, met and married a man named Dr. William Craig Judd, who was a World War I veteran. Dr. Judd was almost 20 years older than Ruth. The newly married Judds moved to Mexico, where Dr. Judd would work for a mining company as a medic. Unfortunately, her new husband, who had been injured during the war, had a really bad addiction to morphine. Because of this, he was both emotionally and financially unstable. Dr. Judd had a difficult time finding work, and when he did find a job, he wouldn't be able to hold it down for very long. They would move often, and oftentimes without a guaranteed income. Ruth had begun to develop some health problems at this time and found herself ill with mild tuberculosis, which she suffered from for the rest of her life. The couple had also tried to have a family, but they were unable to. All of this strain on their relationship led them to living apart by 1930. Dr. Judd would end up moving to Los Angeles, and Ruth would eventually settle in Phoenix. The couple did remain in contact, and the separation appeared to be fairly amicable. She would work as a tutor for a wealthy family for a little while to support herself, and the two would remain married. It was at this time that she met John Happy Jack Halloran, who is a 44-year-old businessman with ties to the lumber industry and politics. He had a reputation for being a ladies' man, and despite the fact that both of them were married, they began a relationship together. Ruth eventually found a job at the Gruno Clinic, where she worked as a medical secretary. There, she would meet Agnes Anne Leroy and her roommate, Hedvig Sammy Samuelson, who was a teacher. In a small world coincidence, they were renting a bungalow from John Halloran. Anne and Sammy had both moved to Alaska for work where they had met, and they became so close that they both moved to Phoenix after Sammy was diagnosed with tuberculosis and needed someone to take care of her in a less cold climate. Many sources speculate that the women were a couple, but it's never been confirmed. The three women became close friends. They had a lot in common and bonded over the fact that they were all working women at a time when most women didn't want to work towards a career. Ruth ended up moving into their bungalow for a little while, but she would end up moving out to her own place, an apartment a few blocks away. It is likely that she moved out because of the tension that broke out between the women who had all possibly had some sort of relationship with Halloran. He sounds like kind of a dog. He doesn't sound like good news. I don't know, like, he's older than them. Much older, because they were all quite young women in their early 20s. Yes, they were younger kind of professional women. He was in his, like, 40s. Yeah. And he was older, he was married, he had ties to politics, he had money. Yeah. And so you can definitely see where the kind of power imbalance is here, especially since he owned 
the bungalow that they were renting from him. So, like, he had the excuse to kind of be there all the time. And he would have that control over them, too. Like, hey, I own the house that you live in. Very kind of, like, predatory vibes. Sorry, Jack. Yeah, Yeah, sorry, Jack. Not a fan. October 16th, 1931 was a Friday night. Ruth, Sammy, and Anne got together at the bungalow for a girls' night, as they often did. Once again, a fight broke out between the girls, and all three of them ended up being shot by the same gun. Ruth was shot in her hand, and Anne and Sammy were both fatally wounded. And honestly, if the story ended here, we would not be talking about it today. This is where things would take a very dark turn that would become a part of true crime history. To this day, we still don't know what the fight was about or even the full truth about what happened in the house that night. Ruth, the only survivor, has changed her story many times. They could have fought over Halloran, money, jealousy, who knows. There's this really amazing interview with Ruth that was filmed in 1969. It's up on YouTube in two parts if you want to see it. But basically, she's this frail-looking grandma at this point, and they talk to her as well as other people involved in the case, including the main detective. She talks about how she was at their house making dessert when Sammy came at her with a gun. They got into a yelling match and Anne ended up coming behind her and hitting her head. She said that she then grabbed a bread knife and stabbed her in the shoulder twice, but the knife broke, at which point she used her hand to push away the gun. She claims that at this point, Sammy was shot through her hand and into her chest and that another bullet jammed, causing an injury on Ruth's left hand. Then it basically cuts to the lead detective talking about how her story would never stay the same and that there was very obvious evidence that the girls, or at least one of them, was shot while laying in bed. The whole thing is really confusing and you can understand the frustration that the detective feels even over 30 years after the murders had occurred. Either way, what happened next will absolutely shock you. Anne's lifeless body was stuffed into a travel trunk. Sammy was larger and she could not fit into one suitcase. Her body was dismembered, wrapped in clothing, and placed into multiple suitcases. And honestly, I need to stop finding crime scene photos <laughs> and clicking them. I don't know what is wrong with me. They These are honestly, I thought they were even worse than the Black Dahlia photos. Whoever killed the Black Dahlia, as bad as it sounds, like they knew what they were doing. They knew how to dismember a body. The only way that I can describe what happened to this woman was that she was just roughly butchered. I also came across her autopsy photos when I was researching. They're pretty chilling. Something about them being in black and white almost tricks you into thinking that the body in all different pieces isn't real, but then your brain kind of kicks in and you're like, oh god, that's that's a human being right there. I don't even want to think about what the photos would look like in color. They would be just... Yeah. And it's I, mangled. She I, was mangled. I have it's... a pretty strong stomach for these kinds yeah. of things. They don't usually bother me, but I have to say that pretty, yeah, eerie for sure. Like, I'm, I'm dead inside, but not that dead inside, but that's not going to bother me. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so Ruth, she took all of this luggage and she boarded a train to Los Angeles. So let's think about that. She boarded a train with a bunch of trunks and suitcases filled with one fully intact dead body and the cut up pieces of another one. All of this began to smell, obviously, and the luggage began to leak a dark-colored liquid. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, like, Phoenix, Arizona, and then L.A. Well, not even the summer, but it's still hot. Even in October, it would have just been like I mean, Arizona's basically a desert. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, ugh. Apparently, at this time, deer meat smuggling was a huge thing. It was illegal, and people would often try to sneak it past the authorities. Upon seeing and smelling this, a baggage handler alerted another baggage handler in L.A., and it was tagged for inspection. When she arrived in L.A., she was asked to open everything up so that it could be looked at. Ruth told them that it, was, it wasn't an issue, no problem, but she told them that she couldn't find the keys and that her husband must have them. She then met up with her brother, who she had called to pick her up, and he had no idea what had just happened. She got into his car, and they just drove off. It just occurred to me. The, the baggage handler in Phoenix, where she started, was like, mm, something fishy about these, but you know what? I'm going to make it the Los Angeles train station problem. <laughs> this is a later issue. I'm not... De- it was like his last day. Yeah, he's like, no. It's a Friday at like 4.30. I'm off at 5. 
I'm just gonna let them know. I am I'm not gonna deal with this. One day from retirement, I am not doing this. I, you know what? I don't really blame him. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't want to deal with it either. Because when the locks were picked and the grisly truth was discovered, uh. it was not as we know, dear me. At this point, Ruth's brother had dropped her off and she had gone on the run. She would eventually surrender while hiding out in a funeral home due to an emotional appeal by her husband. What was her game plan? I don't know. Because I've been, I've been trying to figure this out the entire time we've been looking at this case. And it's like, okay, you have these bodies. They're in trunks. You arrive in L.A. What's the next step? Well, and at the risk of getting a little ahead of ourselves, some people thought that maybe she would want to, like, dump them in the ocean and, like, make it the yeah. ocean's problem. Which I could see. But also, the risk that you're putting yourself into traveling with these bodies, these corpses in your trunks, why didn't you just drive them out into the middle of the Arizona desert and make it a vulture's problem? You know, like, why? Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to me. So, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, the press ate this story up, and soon enough, it was everywhere. Ruth was labeled the trunk murderess, along with a few other things, and rumors were flying. Some papers said that the three women were involved in a love triangle, while others said that they were all in love with Halloran. People talk a lot about the true crime obsession that current society has, but the reality of it is, is that we've always been fascinated with this kind of thing. The crime scene was absolutely destroyed by the press, as well as neighbors who came to investigate and see what happened. Some reports even say that people paid 10 cents to be able to see where the women were killed. People have always been fascinated by the macabre. The trial itself started in January of 1932, and it lasted three weeks. It didn't take long until Winnie Ruth Judd was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death by hanging. She was sent to the Arizona State Prison, where she was to remain on death row until her execution. The first of multiple appeals were filed and rejected. Her defense argued that she was not guilty due to insanity, and because of this, the self-defense argument was not used in court. During her trial, Winnie Ruth Judd did not take the stand in her defense even once. And the really wild thing is that the entire dismemberment thing was never brought up no. in court. Which just shocked me. Ruth was never actually tried for the murder of Sammy at all. The state argued that the relationship between her and Anne had gone sour because of jealousy over Halloran, and that Ruth had shot herself in the hand just so she could claim self-defense. She began to see a large amount of support from both the general public as well as political leaders who did not want to see her executed on the grounds that she was mentally ill. She was granted an appeal just days before she was sentenced to die so that they could evaluate her sanity and mental state at the time of the murders. She was found criminally insane and her death sentence was changed to a life sentence. She was going to spend the rest of her life at the Arizona State Mental Hospital. Happy Jack Halloran came under suspicion and was indicted as an accomplice to murder. This time, Ruth would be a star witness. She testified for three days and talked about how she had gone to the bungalow to play bridge with the women and that a fight had broken out over Ruth introducing another woman to Halloran. She said it was at this point that she killed the women in self-defense and that she had Halloran come to the house shortly after to help her with the bodies. She claimed that it was him who produced a large trunk where they stored the bodies and that he made her swear not to tell anyone what happened. She also claims to have repackaged the bodies two days after the murders into multiple pieces of luggage. Halloran also did not take the stand in his defense during the trial. His lawyer stated that the story Ruth had told was nothing more than the story of an insane person and that if Ruth had killed the other women in self-defense, as she claimed, then no crime could actually be linked to Halloran and the charges were in eventually dismissed due to the case being so inconsistent. He didn't get off scot-free though. This entire thing basically ruined his life, and he lost his good reputation, causing many of his clients and business associates to cut ties with him. This caused him to lose his social status, and he died shortly after in 1939. Winnie Ruth Judd made Mary Bell look like a model patient. Oh no. She would escape from here multiple times between 1933 and 1963, which is honestly pretty impressive can't hold her down can and you, you? Can't. <laughs> one of these escapes took place on the eight year anniversary of her arrest she pulled this old trick <laughs> she used boxes towels and bottles to create what looked like a sleeping person under her sheets and she was on the run for six days and a little over a month later she would escape again 
This time, she would make it to Yuma, Arizona by walking 200 miles on foot across railroad tracks. This time, she was caught and she was placed in solitary confinement for two years. <laughs> like, that in itself is already pretty damn impressive. She yeah. was like, I'm hitting the railroad, we're good to go. But over the next year, she would escape three more times for a few days at a time. And honestly, the more you read about these escapes, the less it seems like she was, like, sneaky and, like, pull in her like James Bond moment and it seems more like the staff were just not at all paying any attention as they should have been no no (laughs) the final escape happened on October 8th 1963 this time she simply just walked out the front door using a key to the hospital that a friend had given her she made her way to San Francisco where she would spend the next six years working as a live-in maid for a wealthy family under the name Marion Kane, which honestly, as far as fake names go, it's a pretty good one. I like Marion Kane. Yeah, that's pretty good. It it does sound like, to me, it sounds like something from like, uh, like a Batman. Like she sounds like a Batman villain or a Batman character somehow. I like, I see like Marion Kane, the movie star. Oh, totally. I'm in the pictures. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, you, obviously she escaped what, seven times in total? Yep. She was obviously learning her lesson each time, and she was like, okay, that didn't work. What are we going to do next? <laughs> I thought you meant learning her lesson, like learning that she was doing the wrong thing. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no she no, was she... figuring it out because she was getting better and better. Totally. She was probably like, okay, all right, which, which like, uh, handlers can I trick? I mean, someone just straight up was like, here, honey, here's the key to the front door. You, and I mean, you she, let yourself out. She was a very, like not alarming woman to see because she was small she was frail she was probably reasonably likable i mean and i mean at this point so this is uh the final escape uh 1963 so she's already been incarcerated for 30 years so she's not the little young lady that we know her as during the murder she's become a mature woman in her like what, 50s at this She's point? She's figured her shit out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Six years she was uh, on the lam for. She had escaped six times prior and then somehow managed just to be able to, like, walk out, mosey on down to San Francisco, and she was working in a beautiful mansion that overlooked the bay. Sounds nice. It does. <laughs> her true identity was eventually found out, and she was arrested and returned to the Arizona State Hospital on August 18th, 1969. Winnie Ruth hired a new lawyer at this point. Her attorney of choice was Melvin Belly, who was a well-known writer and actor. And he was a really interesting man. It honestly really surprised me to see how many well-known celebrities he represented. Some of his clients included Zaza Gabor, Muhammad Ali, Chuck Berry, Mae West, and he even represented Jack Ruby, who was the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. That's pretty high profile. That's a big resume. Uh, yeah, very impressive resume. I think it's safe to say that Ruth probably felt like she was in good hands being represented by someone with this big reputation. Melvin Belly assigned the case to fellow attorney Larry Debus or Dubus? Debus? Debus. Debus. Larry Debus. The goal at this point was to have Ruth paroled and released. The case was brought to Arizona Governor Jack Williams, who said that he would sign the release as long as it was kept hush-hush. Good for her. I guess so. Yeah, but in a shocking turn of events, Belly instead, he called a press conference where he called for her immediate release. (laughs) So basically, he was told, if you're hush-hush about this, I'll do it. But he decided to hold a press conference. Which is like the opposite Which really confuses me when I was reading it, because I was like, why would he do that? Either way, he was fired (laughs) by (laughs) Larry. And this caused even more legal speed bumps for Ruth's eventual release. And despite all of this shenanigans, Winnie Ruth Judd was officially paroled on December 22nd, 1971. She was issued an absolute discharge in 1983, which meant she was no longer on any parole or other legal supervision. She actually went back to California to work for the family that had hired her upon one of her escapes. They hired her despite the fact that she worked for them under a fake name for six years after escaping. (laughs) They must have really liked her, or maybe they felt sorry for her and they wanted to help her out. Honestly, it's hard to say. I... 
I, I wonder if they really knew the extent. I feel like they had to because this was a huge story. Like, the whole, all of the U.S. knew about it. Right, and I feel like, if anything, what they would hear would be, like, the newspaper stuff. Yeah, which it was very sensationalized and, like, you know... The tiger murderess. And right? Blah, blah, so blah. I wonder if she was kind of just like, oh, that's not actually what happened. Yeah. And or... I guess, you know, in the six years that she had worked for them during her last escape, she probably developed a really good bond with them. And they were like, you know what? We like you. It's you, fine. You <laughs> lied about being a murderess? It's okay. You clean our house nicely. You're fine. And I think, I could be wrong, so correct me, but I think she, when she did sort of finally finish all of her jail time and everything, she went back to using the Marion, was it Marion Lane? That she, I think she went back to using that Marion Kane. Yeah, oh, Kane, she, yes. she did. Um, she actually, like... The interviews that she did, a lot of them were in 1969, so they were before her release. Oh. And it seemed like afterwards she kind of wanted to step away from that. Yeah. So maybe they were just kind of like, well, Marion is not the same as Winnie Ruth Judd, so we're just going to separate those two and you can still work Yeah, us. I mean, actually, one of the things that they talk about with what she was like as an older woman is that she was a very good storyteller. Mm-hmm. And she would sit there and she would tell these stories, but she would never talk about the murders or any of the bad stuff that had happened. So she liked to talk. Yeah. Just not about the bad stuff she did. What a character. She later returned to Phoenix and she passed away on October 23rd, 1998, at the ripe old age of 93 years old. Her death occurred on the 67th anniversary of her original surrender to the LAPD. She lived a long life. She did. I mean,. To be fair, the murders and stuff, I think she was 26 when the murders happened. Yeah, around there. So between the murders and her eventual death, I guess there's a lot of time for some growing up. Although (laughs) for those 30 years, she just spent her time being like, yeah, I don't like being cooped up. I'm going to escape now. She was her own woman. I don't know. She did not. You couldn't hold her down. True enough. In 1992, a book about Winnie Ruth Judd was written by investigative journalist Jana Boomersbach, who was originally investigating her for a series of news articles. Jana interviewed Ruth numerous times before her death, and the two seemed to have formed a very strong bond. In her book, The Trunk Murderess, Winnie Ruth Judd, she states that after interviewing her, she believed that Ruth was completely innocent. She stated that investigators and the prosecution were biased towards her and that the press didn't help with their over-sensationalized stories. She also pointed out that Phoenix at the time had a very small population of under 50,000 people and that the police were very aware of who Jack Halloran was as well as who he associated with, including the victims, and that his vehicle had been seen at the scene of the crime that night. She even claimed that many members of the police force believed that Ruth was innocent and that the release of Halloran was part of a larger political cover-up. As we stated before, Halloran had numerous ties to the government. She also argued that if Ruth did kill the girls, that there was absolutely no way she could have dismembered Sammy's body on her own. This is when Dr. Brown was introduced into the story. A nurse named Ann Miller, who worked at the Arizona State Hospital in 1936, was interviewed for the book, and she stated that Ruth had told her that a man named Dr. Brown visited her while she was in prison, and that he promised her he would confess to everything. This obviously never happened. However, by this point, the real Dr. Brown had been dead for a few years, and the story kind of just ended there. Boomersbach went as far as to talk to the former Supreme Court Chief Justice Jack D.H. Hayes to review the trial as well as all of the appeals that Ruth had unsuccessfully filed. She believed that Ruth should have been able to claim self-defense and that the worst she should have been charged with was second-degree murder, if anything. After extensive reviews, Hayes concluded that the trial testimony did not have enough evidence that there was premeditation. So first-degree murder states that the person who did the killing planned it out and killed with intent. Second-degree murder states that an unplanned killing occurred. Hayes agreed that Ruth should have been able to claim self-defense and that she should have received a new trial. So what do you guys think? It sounds like quite a few people didn't believe that she was capable of killing two people, let alone dismembering one of them, and dismembering them horribly. I think because of, like, movies and stuff like that, People are led to believe that it's quite easy to uh, pull apart a human body. Yes. It's not. No. Even, like, you know, autopsy technicians and, like, morticians, they have very specific tools and, like, literally power tools to open you up. 
when necessary. It, so, it's very difficult. It takes a lot of force. It takes specialty yes. tools. Um, and I feel like it would take a lot of time. Not only that is like, if you consider that Sammy was kind of like the Black Dahlia, she was bisected at the waist, not as skilled of a person did it, obviously. Um, but also it creates a lot of mess. Yes. Like a human body has got lots of goo in it mm-hmm. at the risk of sounding crude. But like, you know, we've got what, uh, five to six liters, or I always get this confused. It's either five to six liters or five to six pints. I want to say liters. I think it's about eight pints. Correct me if I'm wrong. Feel free. Please always correct us. Um, I'm going to regret saying that, but do it. I mean, it's not going to be uh, an anime style where like the room fills up with blood, but it's going to leave for sure a puddle. So like, are you doing this in the bathtub? And then the other thing is too, is that she was dismembered, you know, at the knees, at the waist, and I'm at the neck, it's not easy to do that unless you know exactly what you're doing. My question, and this is kind of what really solidified it for me that there was a second person, is look at the photo of her and just look at, she was, I think, about five foot six, five seven. She's like 120 pounds tall. Yeah, exactly. And she had tuberculosis. Right, the tuberculosis especially. And Sammy was a larger woman that she was to the point where she had to cut her up in order to fit her in the luggage. But how would she move the body? How would she get her up? How would she do all of that on her own when she was that small? Totally. And even, you know, you consider that Anne was in one piece. And so by the time she was able to pick up Anne, drag Anne into the trunk, she would have been exhausted because yep. her lung capacity wouldn't have been full because of the tuberc- tuberc- tuberculosis, because of the TB. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to turn around, dismember a body, which, like we just said, would take a lot of work. And then also, and I mean, maybe she had all these trunks and suitcases because it was those days, and she'd been doing a lot of traveling in her time. Yeah. But... I struggle to believe that one person would have, like, that many trunks and suitcases. So, to me, someone else would have had to bring those to her. It's hard to say, because, I mean, maybe she took them from the girls. That's true. That's true. There's so many things that we don't know about this case, and she really doesn't make it easy for us to get the truth. No, and even, like, you know, some killers have, like, a deathbed confession where they're like, all right, my time on this earth is done. I'm going to go out with a clean conscience. But she didn't. She passed away in her sleep at, like we said, the ripe old age of 93. And even then she didn't feel compelled to be like, no, this is the truth. So, yeah, I, I, it's one of those things that's, I don't think we're ever really going to figure out how she did it. But I agree. I think there has to have been some kind of accomplice. Absolutely. And it's unfortunately one of those things where it's just so long ago that we're probably just never going to find out. But if you guys think that this is all wrapped up and that we have a, you know, potential theory here that she didn't do it, we're going to make it even more confusing. Yep. Because it's really never that simple. Um, And if you've been listening to our podcast for a while, you know we love our real life true crime plot twists. And honestly, this is just stranger than fiction. It really is. The Winnie Ruth Judd case is no exception, especially when we consider her confession letter. And uh, we have that confession letter right here for you. We want to say the original letter... 19 pages. 19 pages, handwritten. Handwritten. It's out there for you to find. I found it. And uh, I'll be honest, I was fully, like, ready to give the whole thing a read-through. Uh, but I couldn't find, I didn't find it easy to read her handwriting and I got down, I got down the first page and I was like, oh, my eyes, my eyes are square. So, uh, but luckily we did find a couple of sources that kind of broke it down. So we're going to read a couple of excerpts from the confession letter for you. Let's hear it. All right. So April 6th, 1933, I am writing the absolute truth of this case in full confidence that you will use it as you see fit in your best judgment, Mr. Richardson. I have full confidence in you and trust you. This is my first and only confession of the case of the homicide of Anne Leroy and Hedvig Samuelson. Anne was used to the world. I truly was not. Jack was the only man I had gone with since my marriage, and I was ashamed of things I had done. I could not openly compete with her. I was married and ashamed to. Day after day, she lorded it over me, always smiling and fresh and sweet, well knowing she was hurting me with her taunts. 
Many evenings Anne would kiss Jack and caress him in our presence. Then, after he was gone, gloat over not caring a thing for him, but merely working him for money. It was not what Jack did, but the continual taunts made by Anne which drove me beside myself. I could not stand taunts. I just went crazy. The taunts kept me awake. I could not sleep. I cried. I even prayed. I wrote my parents to please come to me. I was losing my mind. Wild ideas kept me awake. I took sleeping sedatives, luminol. And just as a pause in here, because we were talking about it before. Yes. Luminol is, uh, I believe, a barbiturate drug. That's right. So not to be confused with luminol that they use to show, like, blood stains in crime scenes. So this is A-L, not O-L. Exactly. So we do just want to clarify that, because we were both a little confused Yeah, by that, and so. it was the 1930s, so I was like, oh, were we using the same thing for everything? As, you know, oftentimes it's like, ah, oh, this is the wonder drug. It cures this, 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 and you can use it to clean your toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that. But going on, she says, I wrote doctor, my nerves were breaking. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I loved Anne still, but those taunts. I would take more medicine to quiet my nerves, cry to please things get things off my mind and to sleep. She goes on to say, morning. I heard the milkman. Sammy went to the bathroom again. I started to call her, tell her I was there. I really did. Then I began shaking inside and remembered what I had come to do. So this time I crept past the bathroom door, shot Anne. It was a low shot. Sammy called. What fell, Anne? I was hurrying past the door. Sammy came out, demanded to know what was the matter. I was limp. She completely took the gun from my hands. I was non-resistant. I said, Sammy, I am crazy. I have lost my mind. Give me that gun and I will blow my brains out right here in this door. She held the gun and said, you get out of here right this minute. And before I go any further, I want to clarify, we are reading her words. Yes. And if we are to believe everything in this letter, these are not the words of a sane person. Some of the grammar's a little wonky. So just a heads up that it might sound a little strange. Um, But she goes on, I then picked up the knife and went back after her with the knife. As I grabbed for the gun, I stabbed her in the shoulder. The fight with Sammy in that breakfast room door, her own finger on the trigger when the shot went through her chest. Our fight is all about as I have always related. She shot me through the hand as I grabbed for the gun. The gun jammed, we fell to the floor, struggled, and I finally got the gun and shot her and in my wild state, I really do not remember where in the head. I pulled Sammy into the bathroom. I cleaned up the floor. I pulled up the trunk from the garage. It was now about 6.30 or 7 a.m. I tugged and pulled and finally got Anne from the bed into the trunk. Now, it doesn't sound possible, but all this took two hours. I left for the office. I had pulled the trunk with Anne's body into the living room, but the trunk was unlocked. Sammy was on the bathroom floor all day Saturday. This all happened in the morning. I stayed in my office until 4 p.m., I then took the bag home with me and the gun, knife, pajamas, and dress. I fed my cat and went back to the 2929 North 2nd Street house at around 6 p.m. I really had nothing definite in my mind. No plans made. In fact, except for an irresistible impulse to get Anne, I had no other plans. I entered the house through the bathroom window, getting a chair from next door to climb in. I pulled the trunk back into the hall and tried to lift Sammy into it. But that was utterly impossible. I couldn't possibly lift her. She was too heavy and her body was stiff. I then got two cheap knives from the kitchen and severed her body into portions I could lift. I was hours doing this and then inch by inch pulling the trunk back into the living room. So I guess this, if this is true, it does kind of explain like kind of our questions before how that she was like, a small, frail person, and that was why she had to cut Sammy up, because Sammy was too big for her to move around, and that it happened kind of over the course of a day, rather than a few hours, like some people believe. Yes. But again, like, it just seems like at this point, there were so many times where, like, if there were shots fired inside the bungalow, and they were in a residential area, Yes. why did no one say anything? And like... You know, she said she took the chair from next door. Well, did she have to ask for this chair? Did she just take a random chair from outside? Yeah. To me, I feel like, from what we've kind of learned studying, like, the Black Dahlia, yeah. Um, 
women who lived alone or together at this time, people kind of like knew about them. They knew that they were there. And I feel like if a neighbor heard a gunshot coming from anywhere, let alone a house that they knew like a bunch of women lived in. And women that were having parties all the time and like having men over. Yeah. Like they would have had a little bit of a reputation to say the least. Because we're looking at at least, at least three gunshots. Yes, at least. And I just have a really hard time feeling like no one would hear that. But I don't know. I don't know. This letter is really interesting. It is interesting, but I almost feel like it brings out more questions than it answers. Oh, I was filled with questions after yeah. reading this. It's, I mean, it, the whole thing is a mess. The letter was only discovered in 2014, but she had written it in 1933. Ruth called the letter, which was addressed to her attorney, her first and only confession. In the letter, she said that she had planned and carried out the murder of Anne because she was jealous that Halloran was paying attention to her. And she admits that she had no intention to kill Sammy, but that she didn't have a choice but to kill her when Sammy entered the room. She even admits in the letter, like we saw, to dismembering the body by herself and stuffing the two women in the luggage on her own. According to a New York Times article, her attorney claimed that she didn't, or rather he didn't show the letter to anyone because it would negatively affect an appeal that he had filed for her. Interestingly enough, even Ruth's husband told investigators that he had a hard time believing Halloran was involved. So we do just want to clarify that this letter, so it was donated Yes. In 2014. Yes, and anonymously as well. Some people think that it was um, Richardson's family that donated it, but it's not confirmed because it was donated anonymously. So basically, she wrote it in 1933, and no one really knew about it until far after her death. Yes, because she passed away That's in right. 1998. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who believe that this letter was written to aid in her insanity defense and that it was an attempt to pass the guilt over to Halloran. By the time the letter was discovered, it was obviously too late. However, it is strongly believed that the letter was just one of many confessions Ruth would give. At this point, it was well known that she would change her story often to suit her, however she needed it to. And the tricky thing, or rather that is the tricky thing with a lot of these cases, it might remind you a bit of our Black Dahlia series. It's difficult to find out the truth when the story has changed so many times, you know, things have been admitted or people involved have just passed away. The truth gets lost with time and sometimes we don't, we just don't find out the real story. The case of Winnie Ruth Judd is a fascinating one. Could she have really killed two women, cut up one of the bodies into multiple pieces, and just put herself on a train hoping for the best? Did someone help her? Was Jack Halloran involved? Was Dr. Brown involved? Unfortunately, the truth most likely died with Ruth, and we will never know. What we do know is that while Winnie Ruth Judd may not have been a household name when it comes to true crime, her story is one you're probably never going to forget. So Charlotte, what do you think (laughs) happened here? At the risk of sounding a little too diplomatic, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. If what happened when she was 16 was true with her falsely accusing her boyfriend and getting him into a lot of trouble, I don't see why she couldn't be capable of escalating to murder if she felt like she had been wronged. Ruth was obviously a woman who liked getting her way. Plus, if she was on the luminol, which I did a little bit of research, and it can really fuck around with your mental beat like your mental state and your emotional state it's rough stuff you know she was going through all this stuff with like a potential love triangle and like being married but also sleeping with jack and like all this stuff i think we can all agree that ruth might not have been in the best state mentally i think that's fair um and i think on the flip side while i I do believe that eh, it's possible she could have done it all by herself I think that Jack Halloran definitely could have used her as a scapegoat. Whether she helped with the murders and dismemberment, or if she was completely innocent, because I think him being this kind of, like, person in a position of power, with the power imbalance with the women, I could see him being like, Ruth's vulnerable, I can get away with some stuff and blame it on her. Like, I I could definitely see that. So, uh, I don't know. I, I think everyone was involved in at least a little way, I I don't, I don't know. I don't have a hard answer. I don't have a hard answer. I can't come up with it. Do you think she should have been the only one punished for this crime? No, absolutely not. I think the way that Jack Halloran got off pretty much scot-free, I mean, yes, his career and everything was ruined, but, like, he didn't sound like a great person anyway, so, like, quite frankly, what comes around goes around. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, I think Jack Halloran should have gotten more punishment than he did, for sure. After watching her 1969 interview, I can definitely see why she would have been a difficult person to get the truth out of. Even in the span of that interview, her story changes over and over. And after hearing the people that were involved in the case talk about it, I really don't know if she actually ever told the truth about what happened. So for me at this point, we have to look at the facts. It is clear because of the stains on the mattresses found in the house that at least one person was killed while in bed and that there is a possibility that both women were in bed at the time. I think jealousy was clearly a huge issue with her and she hadn't handled it well before. And jealousy is a real toxic one. It goes septic if you let it Ish, stew. Sure, that stews real fast. Yeah. I honestly, I... I think she killed Anne because she was angry with her, and I think she killed Sammy just because she was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And honestly, we need to also think about, again, how difficult it is to dismember someone. Again, it requires specific tools and a lot of strength, and the amount of muscle, tissue, and don't forget bones mm -hmm. that you have to go through to literally cut someone in half, which she did. Sammy was completely butchered. And I have a really hard time believing that she did all of that by herself. I, I really, really do. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And that sounds brutal. That sounds gross. But it, it is a big job to dismember a body. For sure. Uh, was Halloran involved? I don't know. But I think he was definitely a huge source of tension between the women, despite Ruth still being married to Dr. Judd. So do I think she was innocent? Absolutely not. I do think that she was a part of these murders but I don't think that she was the only one that was there that night. No, I, I have to agree with you there for sure. But anyway, despite all of that, there we go. That's that's, that's the story of Winnie Ruth Judd, the trunk murderess. This entire case sounds like something out of a movie. It is completely unbelievable. We hope you all enjoyed this one. And uh, next week, we are starting a brand new series it is possibly our biggest one yet, and we are honestly so excited to bring it to you. Yes. Uh, next week uh, starts uh, with episode 10, so that means we're 10 episodes in already. 10! Which is crazy considering, um, you know, you I tweeted something back in January. We Did should tell this story. We should. We should. Let's tell this story, okay. Charlotte. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I tweeted something innocuously, not thinking anything would come out of it. I said something along the lines of, like, the feminine urge to start a true crime podcast. And what she didn't know was that I was, like, quietly and secretly going crazy at that time <laughs> because I have been wanting to start a podcast. Those of you who have followed me on other platforms, you know I love true crime, and I have been talking about doing this for probably the last, like, two or three years. Um, I've struggled to find someone to do it with and I kind of settled on the fact that I might be on my own and literally the next day she fucking posts this so like I don't know if that's fate or destiny or what but it's meant there to we be. go but I basically just kind of frantically messaged her like a crazy person and was like were you serious <laughs> and I'm like fuck yeah I'm serious like let's do it and prior to this like Dina and I had been like social media acquaintances yeah we have kind of like some friends in common kind of and so it was just like yeah reach out and then it became a thing so we did it yeah. and the first time that we actually met in person was to discuss our promo shots we had never met in person before yeah um and here we are almost 10 episodes later crazy absolutely bonkers so thank you guys for being a part of this yes. like we couldn't do this without you no we're very lucky that a lot of you have been so supportive like right off the bat you were sharing our stuff and continue to share our stuff and we've also heard uh a lot of you or at least some of you mm -hmm. might be interested in some merch which is we're working on it we're working on bringing you that sweet sweet merch yes. we really are because i'm i'm a graphic designer by trade she's pro talented that's, you guys that's my like, job she good and i one of my favorite things to do is merch i love t-shirts i love stickers i love all that stuff so like we're 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 working on it it's gonna happen work, but yeah. we just have some um unfortunate big girl podcast business stuff to deal with yes. before we can do that but we are working on it we want to bring you the merch because the faster we can start doing stuff like that the more 
awesome content we can bring you and the more you guys share it and get it out there the like it's it's all it's all coming it's all coming it really is it's kind of crazy to see this like evolve and turn into a real life actual podcast with real listeners thanks guys yeah absolutely thank you so much with all that being said, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. We also do a live premiere every Saturday we at sure do. 12 p.m. MST for each episode, so please join us there. We love watching you all in real time take it all in. And yeah, and getting your feedback and your thoughts on the case is always really neat. Mm-hmm. Brings up some questions and stuff that we haven't even thought of ourselves. Definitely. And you can also find us on social media. I am Dina V on Twitch, Dina V IG on Instagram, and Dina V tweets on Twitter. And I am ominous underscore walrus yes, on Twitter. And yes, you are. And ominous walrus on Instagram because some meanie actually yeah, funny story about this not to get off on a little sidetrack but on twitch which i very very rarely stream i do some charity streams a couple of times a year but on twitch i'm also ominous underscore walrus because apparently there's a russian counter-strike player with ominous walrus already has his name you're ominous walrus he is ominous walrus or <laughs> ominous walrus i like it but yeah so anyway thanks for listening you guys this has been the, the grim, grim curriculum, curriculum.